Without further ado, I'm going to start. So good morning, afternoon and evening, depending on where you're connecting from. Welcome to everyone. We are pleased to have you join us for CO2 and seawater reference materials yesterday, today and tomorrow. This webinar is presented by the Interagency Working Group on Ocean Acidification and the U.S. NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. This is the first community engagement in a larger effort to increase the resilience of the production and distribution of ocean carbonate chemistry reference materials. My name is Libby Jewett. I'm director of NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program here in the United States. I'm also chair of the US OA Interagency Working Group, which is a group of federal agencies that work together here in the US and former co-chair and now executive council member of the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. And through all of these entities, um, we are working on this topic. So in all of these roles that I serve, I've been pushing for about 10 years now, since founding the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, in fact, to ensure that we have resilience in the supply of certified reference materials for our ocean carbon work for the long term. As I know you indeed also are experiencing, COVID has exposed the fundamental issue with having just one point of failure. We in the US are committed to ensuring a supply of certified reference materials produced in the US, but it seems unwise that we haven't identified another source in another country, or better yet, in more than one other country. And when we do this, it will be very important to set up a robust system for cross calibration. So all reference materials link, that link back to the single source. We all know that Andrew Dixon will eventually retire, or at least he should have the option to retire. So we have invited him here today to inform us all on his experience with certified reference material production and his vision for the future. Now I would like to introduce Andrew. Andrew Dixon is a professor of marine chemistry at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography of the University of California, San Diego. Although originally from the United Kingdom, he has been in the US since 1980. And after arriving here, has focused his studies on a variety of aspects of seawater um, CO2 chemistry, including the topic of today's talk. His student days were spent at the University of Liverpool in the UK, followed by postdoctoral positions at the Plymouth Laboratory of the Marine Biological Association and the University of Florida, ultimately arriving at Scripps in 1983, where he's remained since, ultimately becoming a professor in 2010. Interestingly, his original PhD work on seawater acid-based chemistry was inspired by a couple of 1973 papers on what came to be known as ocean acidification. And in the last 10 years or so years, he has revisited this area by helping others to learn about seawater CO2 chemistry, together with how to measure it reliably at short courses, both in the US and in a variety of other countries around the world. Most importantly, I wanna thank Andrew profoundly and publicly for his many important contributions to the field of ocean chemistry and to ensuring the robustness of all of our measurements across the globe. Ocean carbon science has been built on his shoulders, among others. Before I hand it over to Andrew, I have a few technical details to cover. As Andrew walks through his presentation, please type any questions for him into the questions box, and we will get to them after he finishes. We want our participants to know that we will be recording this webinar and want to move the ensuing discussion into the OA information exchange, as I am sure we will ha not have enough time to answer everyone's questions. A link to the OA information exchange is in the questions box. We will also post this webinar for future viewing on the OAP, our program's YouTube channel and we'll broadcast links to this on the OAIE, on the IWG OA website, and on the Go On website. Finally, we consider this just the beginning of the conversation. 
we need to build a strong community-wide process to build resilience into the global certified reference material system, which we are launching with this webinar. Soon we will launch a community survey that we can use to assess CRM needs worldwide. We will circulate the survey when the webinar video is ready for posting. Thank you for joining. By the way, as of today, we had over 500 people registered. <laughs> so it's obviously a conversation that everyone wants to listen to. Um, please keep in touch. And now I want to turn it over to Andrew. Thank you very much, Libby. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you who are out there at various time zones around the world. Many of you already my friends, some I hope yet to become it. I'm here in my bunker in San Diego, still somewhat sheltering from the COVID here. And I'll talk a little bit about that later in my talk. As you see from the title, what I'm looking to give you is a picture of the work I've done in CO2 seawater reference materials, both in the past, the problems of today with COVID, and some thoughts for how we move ahead from this point to achieve what Libby just talked about in terms of the resilience of a system of production and distribution that allows scientific work in CO2 related activities. Now at the present, looking at anthropogenic CO2 in grace into the oceans and ocean acidification to continue into the foreseeable future. So thank you all for giving me this opportunity to talk. So the opening question really, I think is, what do I mean when I say reference material? And the key to a reference material is here in the red on this slide. It's a homogeneous stable substance, which one or more properties are established sufficiently well to calibrate a chemical analyzer or to validate a measurement processes. This two, these two pieces are important, but unfortunately, it's not entirely practical to do both at the same time. And I'll come back to that point in the future. Now you'll see as I go through slides that although there's slides with a lot of text upon them, I'm not going to reiterate all the text because otherwise I'm gonna be here for a while. I've been doing this for more than 30 years. So if I'm giving you my life story, squeezing it into 30 minutes either implies I talk a lot more quickly than I commonly do or that I leave a lot out. So why indeed do we need these reference materials? It was originally thought of at a meeting in uh, La Jolla early on that what we needed for CO2 was a common standard where the picture in people's minds was the IAPSO standard seawater. And if such a standard existed, then surely CO2 measurements around the world would be meaningfully better and hopefully completely comparable. And however, as we went forward, it became apparent that when we were having some success distributing reference materials, that it was much more appropriate to go beyond this calibrate a chemical analyzer to the next part, which is validate the measurement process. That is, if you could independently calibrate the analyzer, you could now use reference materials to check that the measurements you were making on board ship, in the lab, wherever, whenever, were comparable to the way you had done it before. And to the extent that you could use the value ascribed to the reference material to the way others would be doing it at the same time in different places or at different times in different places. And the need for these reference materials has grown through the years. And you'll see that emphasized as I move forward. So our reference material program is at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. It's been supported, as I said, for over 30 years. Our first grant came in 1989. And in those 30 years, we've prepared more than 190 separate batches. You'll see the discussion of why I'm a little vaguer about the number shortly of the CO2 and seawater reference material that is most known to all of you, which we actually calibrate for total dissolved inorganic carbon since about 1990 and for total alkalinity since about 1996. We also provide information values for salinity and some idea at least of what the nutrients were when it left our hands. But of course, the silicate changes significantly sitting in a glass bottle. Now, it wasn't all plain sailing. Six of these batches were unstable. 
And unfortunately, you don't find that out before. And it seems that this was due to contamination with the mercury tolerant organism, which changes the alkalinity and the total carbon with time in the bottles. Another batch actually had some problems with alkalinity. And it seemed that what we had was a group of bottles that had been reused many times and come back to us. And they now were more reactive with seawater than such bottles typically were, and certainly than such bottles were when new. So that's something that happened that we noticed, but didn't really have a way to tell was happening. We threw away a lot of bottles thinking they had problems, and the problem mostly has gone away. But these words thinking and mostly emphasize the rather empirical nature of that. Now, our rate of production of these materials has changed, both in how frequently the batches are prepared, but also the size of a batch. In 2019, the last of the good old days, we made over 11,000 bottles of CO2 reference material. And as we've had our program, it's been recognized that distributing calibrated alkalinity titrant to others can be very helpful, and also Tris buffers for calibration of electrometric measurements for total hydrogen ion concentration based measurements of pH. So, first, a brief history. As I said, 1986, there was a committee on climate change in the ocean, which the Joint Committee of SCORE and IOC, and chaired by Dr. Roger Ravel, met at Scripps in 1986. And I was invited to one of its sessions because I knew. Dave Keeling at Scripps, and he knew I was interested in the CO2 and seawater aspect. And during this, this is when this need for seawater carbon standards was first really brought up. Because in 1986, plans were being made for, particularly for the US, to make carbon measurements on a planned hydrographic program from the World Ocean Circulation Experiment, which at that point did not have carbon as part of it. And they just had an agreement from the US Department of Energy that they would support carbon measurements, and but it would be limited to only two berths on the ship, all, all the kinds of discussions I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And Dave Keeling and I went away from that meeting and said, well, what would it take to actually do this, to produce carbon standards that could be done? And we, we put a proposal into the US National Science Foundation which was, as is typical of proposals that have a significant imprint from David Keeling, fairly elaborate and though well thought out. It was expensive, it was turned down. We were, however, invited to rethink quite what was needed, do it cheaper and come back. And so we actually got a proposal funded from the NSF Chemical Oceanography Program in 1989 as what was then called a pre jagoffs activity. The Joint Global Ocean Flux Study had been planned but had not yet quite started in the water and they were had some money that was being offered to start it going. And the CO2 measurements I just previously mentioned to you were adopted as a jagoffs activity so that they were often referred to as the Wos Jagoffs CO2 survey. And this funding, as I said, was a collaboration with Dr. Keeling, whose laboratory already had expertise in measuring total dissolved inorganic carbon in seawater. And we started off great. We produced one batch. It was stable for months. We produced another one. It seemed stable, so we sent it out to a bunch of other people to do an interlaboratory comparison. And that comparison is here. Now, if you look at this carefully and you have access to the slides, so that option is exists later, what you will see is that every laboratory pretty well gets a different number. And only a small subset actually broadly agreed with the number produced by the Keeling lab, the pink band in the middle. Interestingly, the average number of all the other laboratories also would fit in that band. 
suggesting in some rather odd way that all the random errors are actually, all the systematic errors from different laboratories are somewhat randomly distributed. So this is what people were hoping to fix by having a common calibration. But we went on and batches three, four, five were unstable. They had, we found later, this mercury tolerant organism. So we went, oh my God, the Woe survey has started. We need to produce reference materials. We'll make some synthetically on, in sodium chloride solutions. And we did that. And those were used at sea in 1990 on cruises in the Pacific. The next two batches, eight and nine, was still unstable. But now we did realize it was mercury tolerant organisms that was causing the problem. And we were advised by a microbiologist that there was one particularly reliable way to get rid of them, either to heat everything to an extremely high temperature, 500 degrees centigrade or so, or to expose them to fairly concentrated acid, at least two molar HCl. Higher still was better because what you were basically trying to do was lyse the cells. A lot of this is described in this article, which I appeared in Oceanography Magazine in 2010. And it, it goes pretty well through the background to our program and a lot of other bits and pieces about ocean measurement standards up till that point. So then we move really into what I refer to here as the Woese Jagoffs era. And additional funding was provided to us by the Department of Energy in late 1991 to keep providing these materials in significant numbers to the Woese Hydrographic Program Jagoffs CO2 survey, and also to provide them to international partners who were similarly involved in doing that survey. And we were now distributing bottles of seawater predominantly to US labs, but also in a meaningful quantities to lab labs in countries like Japan and Germany and the UK, but particularly those are the ones I remember. I think there were a couple of the Canada as well. There were a couple of others. And this, by later during that period, we finally got alkalinity running well in terms of having a reliable accurate procedure and that procedure has been used to calibrate all our new batches after that point but it was also we went back and assigned values to the earlier batches i had mentioned that potentially those earlier batches had to be stable for alkalinity but that we didn't yet have a way to say this was unambiguously a value we would trust and we went back and assigned those and let people know and a lot of effort during that time was spent just at every meeting explaining to people the benefits you got from regular use of reference materials. And it was fascinating to see the difference between starting out with people going, well, I just want to calibrate, to later, by 1996, where at meetings you'd see people simply putting up a control chart showing that they had used our reference materials that they'd got reliable values throughout their crews, and therefore you could believe that the other values throughout their crews were necessarily reliable. And of course, that's migrated to people simply saying they use the reference fields, and people's expectation is that that control chart existed. But it made a big difference. Here's a plot we put together at the beginning of this century, which has Dave, this was done when people were trying to say, can we make a global picture of what the CO2 system looks like moving towards the early GLODAP work? And all these cruises in black were cruises that actually took our reference materials on them. The zero line is saying, let's assume that that on average was right in those cruises. These ones are clearly a little odd. And then let's plot all the other cruises that we've always thought of as great CO2 cruises on the same plot where we have an option to compare in the deep water, say, to see what a cruise to cruise offset might be. And what you see, I think, is that 
without reference materials and with the best care in the world that was available, you did not get answers that ultimately could be considered coherent at anywhere near the precision of the data. And of course, that fits exactly with this figure. Everybody's getting really pretty good precise answers, but they aren't agreeing with each other. So we move on to the recent era. The Department of Energy dropped out of funding reference materials and dropped out of ocean CO2 studies altogether in terms of their support. But the funding support continued from the NSF Chemical Oceanography Program. And of course, it was impractical to say, hey, give us more money. We basically talked with the program managers and said, we're going to put in a charge for the reference materials that's in some way a cost of what it costs to make a bottle of reference material. And we will start charging people for that. And so we started at about $25 in 1998 when it was obvious that we couldn't get by with just the grants we had from NSF without a significant increase. And that was taken up about four years later to $30, stayed there for 10 years and went up to 33. We're almost certainly going to be putting it up again in the near future. So just to give you an idea, if you just took the US inflation rate from $25 in 1998, it would be 40 today. So the general inflation. The demand for these reference seals grew to about 10,000 bottles a year. And as I said, we expanded to have the alkalinity titrant and the twist buffer. So here's a picture of the number of bottles we distributed each year between 1998 and 2020, with the peak here in 2015. But early on, reasonably low and manageable, and then suddenly increasing and increasing. Now, it's got an added flavor to it. In this period, and you can sort of see a glimpse of the lovely California blue skies in the background, we're doing this at a re laboratory remote from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, a few miles away that I had access to. And it was a, an old building on the top of a hill with a beautiful view. And it was, its, it's benefits and its problems were that it was remote. And so for many years, this is where we were producing reference materials. But the red line implies that things changed. As of that day, the university said, nope, this building has asbestos. You should leave now. And we left and people in hazard gear brought everything out and it was distributed to a laboratory I was just moving into, had moved into some years before down on the Scripps campus, but also to another location, uh, which you'll see a brief piece from later in Point Loma, which is about 14 miles from Scripps. It was a large kind of room. And that's where we prepared our reference materials for about a year and a half. During that time, Basically, we were making reference materials in a large loading bay area in uh, one of the, a university property, really about, as I say, about 14 miles from the university. We took empty bottles down there, did the filling process, brought them all back to Scripps, did the analyses, and shipped them out from Scripps. And then finally, we had a newly renovated space at Scripps, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So what you'll see here is this huge increase as the years go by. And realistically, this means more and more people wanted to use reference here. And you go, well, why? Why then? And in part, it's really this idea. This paper came out in 2003, and perhaps it's the first published use of this, these words, ocean acidification. So that initially, we'd been working with surveys, but then we move on and start to have this other need for these reference materials. And of course, this is the start of the 
study of this and ultimately development of places like the Ocean Acidification Program at NOAA here in the US. More recently, we've used reference materials as test materials for an international interlaboratory comparison exercise, which was done in 2017. We have two samples here where they've got a high and a low dissolved in organic carbon. They've got, therefore, different alkalinities and different pH, 7.9 and 7.5 approximately. And you can see from this that people are using our reference materials regularly. And the samples that look closest to our reference materials are typically here in the blue. And those look smoother and cleaner looking, though the pH calibration still has a problem. These are arranged in order of uh, the, that number. So the fact that this is a line is built into the way I ordered it. If it looked like the picture I showed you before, it would be a, a random distribution where you wouldn't know which was right or wrong, perhaps. And so this is another important piece that I think we're going to encourage more moving forwards. So now we come to now, the COVID era. And like when we were told suddenly, leave Mount Soledad tomorrow, or actually at the end of today, do not come back tomorrow. That happened also here in the state of California. And UCSD closed down, doing moving all its teaching to remote and all its employees to working from home. As you might recognize, anything to do with essentially what we've got here, a combination of manufacturer and chemical activities doesn't really happen so well at home. And even when the on-campus research activities resumed in mid-2020, there were really significant restrictions placed on how many laboratory individuals could be present in a single laboratory at one time. It was one person per 250 square feet, and no more than 20% really ought to be present in any building at any one time. And that still exists today. And as the year went by, it became clear that these restrictions were really not going to just go away. And we, we'd always had that dream, but it didn't happen. So we started restarted making our reference fields in what I refer to here as a more socially distanced manner. This phrase socially distanced has appeared so many times, particularly in the US public thing. It's a, a cliche in some ways. I'm not sure exactly how you might speak of it in your own countries, but it really means you just don't contaminate each other with COVID because you don't ever get close to each other. So we're going to try and make reference materials with only one person physically in the lab at any one time. And in early December, we made a limited test batch, about 100 bottles. It seemed OK. It stays, stayed stable through till January at least. So we said, OK, we'll do another. Can we make more bottles? And the suggestion was, well, perhaps we could do it by having a larger batch, filling a bunch of bottles, and then the next day going back and filling more bottles from that batch while leaving it because it's poisoned overnight. And, and we did that, and we did two lots of 150, 300 bottles. They were slightly different, one from another, but they were stable. And then my group realized that we could expand this even by planning to get started quickly, but having a series of people that went into the lab. We did 500 or so bottles by having two people each go in. One would go in, bottle 160, another would leave, another would come in, bottle 160, would leave, actually would leave overstate. They also clean up for potential disinfecting for COVID in between. The third person came in, he actually did about 180 bottles, taking it up to 500. So remember I said that we were producing more bottles in a year. And obviously in this period, we produced bottles, but by no means as many. So we do expect to continue with making these smaller batches and probably for a significant number of months, because certainly here in California, it's not clear exactly how easily and early, we will change back 
towards what we would consider normal. But we're calibrating each of these batches as usual. In fact, we sent about 200 bottles of that larger batch I mentioned for use on a go ship cruise that is leaving from Woods Hole today. And it's doing measurements in the Atlantic with full COVID precautions. Everybody on the ship had to isolate for two weeks before they even got on the ship and have multiple COVID tests during that period. And we're now planning to supply other US survey cruises that are planned for 2021. Though as I comment here, likely with fewer reference materials than would have been wished. But this is the part that I'm sure many of you are worried about. We really do have a very extensive waiting list of potential users. And we're planning to offer limited amounts to as, as many groups as it's practical to do, given the current low rates of production. And we'll be thinking about that and doing, but largely what I'm imagining is I can send you small numbers of reference materials, which you can then use to cross calibrate other internal standards you have in your laboratory or use in a restricted fashion. But small numbers are the most you can hope for. And it may well be that not all of you can reasonably even hope for that in the short term. As soon as we can get more people into the lab, it will increase. So just to give you an idea why that's this problem, I'm going to explain how we actually make these. Essentially, they end up like this. Many of you will have seen these bottles with the seawater in. We first, we, we do for a batch about 1,240 bottles. So we clean about 1,250. If the bottles were new, we put this decal on to remind people it's our bottle. We collect about 750 liters of water, but where we get it from has changed through time. We used to get it from open ocean almost, I mean, outside the on the edge of the California shelf and beyond. But now we just take it from the Scripps seawater system right close to the source. Of course, we also have to put 1,240 bottles somewhere. So we need the bottle storage containers to put the filled bottles in. Then filter the seawater into a large container, add mercury 2 chloride solution, recirculate it to get it well mixed, and diminish any really high PCO2 it has for about 60 to 72 hours. It's sometimes less than that because we have had problems with it, uh, a joint falling apart overnight, and you suddenly have 750 liters of, sea, of mercury contaminated seawater to clean up in the morning. And our environmental health and safety are not fond of that. So we tend to turn the circulation off at night at the moment. And then an approach we now use is to estimate the initial headspace PCO2 at a particular temperature measure the temperature that we're starting bottling. And as we pump it into the bottles, which goes through with more filters and an ultraviolet, we adjust the headspace to allow for any temperature changes. Then we seal, let's put the lid on, label, put the label on, and put away the bottles. Previously, of course, we didn't do that CO2 adjustment. That was, that was developed when we were aiming to do test materials for uh, into comparison exercises and first done in 2013 with a student of mine, Emily Bockman, who helped develop that. So here you see the pump that we're using to fill our bottle materials. And here we were doing batch 100 in November in 2009. So this was in that shipping uh, or large, basically large work bay down at Point Loma, as I said, about 15 miles from Scripps. And this is a brief video. Here you see us filling a bottle carefully. No real bubbling, no bubbles. Get it almost full, so there's a small head space. Put a stopper in with grease on. Move on, there's a small grease gun he was holding. Put the rubber band on. We have a drill press to do it so that one person can do it comfortably without really wearing their hands out. Clip to tighten the band. Comes off of this. Somebody else sticks a label on it. Gets 
put in the heap the, all the ones that have labels, and somebody comes along, picks them up, and puts them away in the boxes. So I had five people there doing that. And it took them many, many hours. And we moved on, doing it with two separate lines here now in our current almost custom designed laboratory for this, where I've got a person filling, a person putting the stoppers in with the grease, a person doing the clips on each side. I got a person at the end doing the labeling, and I've got the person who's holding the camera who's putting them all away into boxes in the room. So this clearly is not one person per 250 square feet. And this is where we fell foul during the COVID era. So we calibrate these reference materials, and I'll just talk about this one and then skim through the next two. But dissolved inorganic carbon was based on an original approach in Dave Keeling's laboratory that had been developed in the 1970s, I believe. And it's what I refer to as an extraction manometric. You weigh the sample, you acidify it under vacuum, you extract the CO2, you condense that CO2 in a vacuum line, you separate it from the water, you take the CO2 part into a manometer where you can measure its volume, temperature, and pressure. This is the old original Keeling manometer set up in his laboratory where it's just simply measuring the height of a mercury column with this kind of traveling microscope system here, cathodometer it was referred to. And then you can comp know exactly how much CO2 there is from an equation of state, which best means you know the volume, you know the temperature, you know the pressure, therefore you know the number of moles. So this approach allows you to do this almost independent of having some other way to calibrate this equipment. And that's what makes it what I refer to here as a reference method. That's what makes it desirable for calibrating standards. It doesn't require that somebody else already had a perfectly good standard you could use. We worked to do our alkalinity method, and I could talk you through this, but I'm not going to. The slide will be at the Ocean Acidification Information site. And we're now studying pH. And again, either of those realistically could be a quarter of a larger lecture. The distribution of our CO2 in seawater reference materials. Well, we've got those boxes. Here's our, our lab where we store boxes. This picture was one that I asked somebody to take for this talk. So you will notice there are not that many boxes there. And that's really because we've already shipped out as many as we can. At this point, we just had the ones I just talked about. Blue here were boxes that had filled with, originally were filled with samples we were going to analyze. And red are uh, HCL that we shipped to, uh, for ourselves to, for use on cruises. So we've got a large space for storing materials. These black drums you see over here, reflect going to our pier site to pick up the water with a stake bed a truck and bring it up to the laboratory to use. Gas cylinders, this is the ingredients for the synthetic air with a known PCO2, you see here the CO2 cylinder, that is used to keep the CO2 constant during the bottling of a reference material. And what you're seeing in the distance here is the other side of the room that we saw earlier with this picture. You see on the right there, you can just see the gas cylinder. So it's a big room, completely dedicated to this program. How, how have we distributed it in that period? Well, here's a couple of pictures that kind of give an image. Strictly speaking, we should have colored the US on this one, but this was our distribution to states in the US. Unsurprisingly, states in the interior of the US are not doing much research into ocean sciences. But Coastal ones most certainly are, with the ones with the darker uh, blues have had the most during that period. At the same time, we've distributed to a lot of countries around the world. Again, of course, countries with coastlines. In fact, in that period, we distributed over 3,000 shipments, about 135,000 bottles to 62 different countries 
of which one of them was the U.S., which had about 31 U.S. states and Puerto Rico. Between 1990 and 1997, we'd done about 17,500. So in total, about 150,000 bottles had been distributed. I say this just to emphasize the scale of what stopped. So what does it really take to achieve this? Well, here's what I think is important. You need to be able to get the seawater because we're using about 720 liters a batch, but I mentioned get 750. We always have some extra that never gets into bottles. And we might even plan to expand a little bit above that. We need space. And it's got to be suitable for this activity. We've got about three large rooms altogether, more than 4,000 square feet equivalent. Two are used for the preparation and distribution of reference materials, one for the chemical laboratory. In that preparation and distribution part, you've seen there the storage and the preparation and the distribution stuff just goes out the door to where FedEx picks it up. So if you think about it, 10,000 bottles in a year is more than five metric tons of seawater, plus the glass, which is also pretty heavy. So a lot of mass leaves our lab on FedEx. We're certainly one of their valued customers at the University of California. We have specialized equipment, the bottles, but they're not that specialized, but you sure as hell need a lot of them. You need equipment for cleaning the bottles. Basically, we bake them to very high temperature to make sure they're clean and to burn off grease and to burn off labels. We need the equipment we use to fill the bottles, and we need the equipment used to do the chemical analyses. We need skilled, trained personnel. I have about three full-time staff working on this program. I put the tilde there really to indicate that the three is made up of a couple of parts that go in, as well as the people that really full-time work on the program. And I have a number of some additional part-time help. And there's also a person, of course, who works on the billing. Those of you that get invoices for these know that somebody has to send those out and sadly often chase them were they not paid on an adequate schedule. And we need overall management of this system, the scientific management, which I largely do, though with a little bit of help from a couple of my technicians, and the financial management, which is done through my university's business office. To give you some idea of what it costs, it's not that expensive when you divide by 10,000, but it's still not dirt cheap. Yeah, we got about 200,000 from the National Science Foundation in 2019. And we got about 330,000 coming in from our cost recovery on bottles of reference material distributed. And UCSD provided us with the things I've marked in green. I mean, the laboratories, the environmental health and safety requirements to have such laboratories active with people getting paid to be there and the like. They also pay for the people working on the billing and the financial management. They also pay myself a prof professorial salary, which covers my uh, salary in the US system, basically for nine months out of 11 that I could get paid. Um, are they making a profit on it being based on the cost, uh, overheads that I bring in? I suspect not, but I try not to have this discussed. So are we doing it perfectly? No, there are enhancements that are still needed. I mean, the current approach, which uses filtered seawater poisoned with mercury two chloride packaged in 500 mil borosilicate 33 glass reagent bottles, grease scrap, has its flaws. First, the mercury is a health hazard. Its use is actively discouraged. It's a recent Minamata Convention on Mercury that's really looking to do that. Some countries have already banned it for use. So reference materials that rely on mercury are long-term problematic. Next, the mass of the glass. 40% of the total mass of uh, one bottle increases the shipping costs accordingly. That is, it costs that amount more to ship than it would just for 60%. It's one and a half times the shipping. The grease on the stoppers can contaminate the seawater with grease, and it's relatively inert. 
as far as the analyses are concerned, but it can clog fine tubing in analytical measuring systems. So it's problematic for some people looking to design newer and alternative systems for handling CO2 measurements that require on more micro tubing. And the glass reagent bottles aren't that cheap. We get them in bulk, we get a good discount, but they're still not cheap and they're even less cheap if you say, and I'd like to buy 10,000. They certainly don't seem cheap when you say, I'd like to buy 10,000. So this is why we started to put in our charge for the bottle to make sure that either you gave us the bottle back to clean and use again, or you gave us enough money to buy another bottle. So we need an alternate biocide to make sure these things stay stable. We need alternate packaging to make them lighter weight, more convenient, and ideally cheaper. So why have we not done that? Well, we've not done that because we've been putting out about 10,000 bottles of seawater each year, and that's pretty well the limit for the money we're bringing in and the money we have. I tend to see it as the NSF funds are used to make sure we have a lab that can do this predominantly. They do some pay for a number of items and repairs of equipment and things like that. And the $33 that we've been charging essentially is the added cost of cleaning the bottle, putting stuff in the bottle, doing all the analyses, getting it all ready for shipping, keeping track of it. And of course, some of the uh, depreciation costs on equipment because the equipment wears out and needs to be replaced. So that's why it hadn't happened thus far. So this really is the tomorrow part. Where should we go from here? What's next? I should point out that the US National Science Foundation has just agreed to fund me for a further three years, for which I'm very grateful. That will bring their total funding of this project over the years to 35 continuous years of funding. I don't know if that's a record within their funding, but I'm sure it's a contender. And we have a lot of appreciation for how much effort went into that. And thinking about the resources is where we need to go. So possible futures. Well, number one, production could just remain at Scripps until it doesn't. Libby mentioned retiring. Um, that is certainly something that's reasonable. Those of you that have seen a recent image of me or can see one now, uh, I might win a lottery, who knows? Or there are other alternatives, but this is step one. It's not entirely ideal. So a variety of possible directions. Production remains at Scripps, but you need a succession in place, plan in place for the personnel, not just me, other people that work for me. In fact, three of the people you saw in that video from 1989, I'm sorry, 1999, are still working in my laboratory. And you're gonna need accesses to additional resources over and above the costs that we've talked about so far, ultimately to ensure that you have long-term sustainability because you're gonna to have to do some redesign and thought and training of people while at the same time paying the people that are doing the redesigning and doing the training. Another alternative, production moves to an alternate location. Of course, that adds some startup costs, like all the equipment we already have, or even let's say we stop and we ship that equipment somewhere else for somebody else to use. Uh, it's not entirely designed for shipping, so there's bound to be startup costs. And again, this of course needs the same resources for long-term sustainability planning. And then the one that Libby alluded to, which is you have more than one location that's able to produce these materials. And ideally, this will improve international availability in addition to ensuring resilience. I say that because it's gotta be easier, let's say you have site in uh, Asia, 
that produces reference materials and is prepared to ship it to other countries in that region, it's going to be much easier than trying to produce them in the US and ship them to countries all over Asia in significant amounts. And same for Europe, obviously, those are our main centers at the moment, but these are likely to change as years go by. So it's necessary to amend which of the things you desire are going to be hard to replicate. You do need the supply of seawater because you are essentially producing a reference, a reference material in a background matrix that does affect how well some of these analyses can be made. For instance, the alkalinity pretty well has to be done in a seawater matrix to get something that's really testing our current ways of measuring alkalinities in seawaters. You need a certain amount of room to do this. You need specialized equipment, you need the personnel, you need the management, you need, and this final one, the funds. I put here the various bits that I think are really the more difficult to just say, oh yeah, we can get that, no trouble. And so thought needs to go into how those are addressed. And you need to emphasize this balance between benefit and costs. And these two, I think, weigh up, if you're thinking about the quality of the reference materials that are needed. We worked initially to get reference materials that were necessary for global ocean surveys. Undoubtedly, the thought there was do it as well as it can be done because these surveys are so expensive and the changes we're looking for are sufficiently small that the better the reference material, the better the chance of our data being good enough to achieve our scientific goals. That's not true in terms of the requirement for uncertainty for everything. I mean, you can always use a good reference material, but you may not justify the costs of doing it for the benefits you get from using it. You need to think about that in terms of the sustainability. Clearly, if we can just keep it going, that's a real benefit, but it takes money to keep it going because you've got to worry about equipment breaking, being upgraded. You've got to worry about people leaving, coming in fresh, needing training. The resilience, that is when you have something like COVID, if you've got just the one point of failure, clearly there's a, that's a cost. But there are costs to getting around that, which you see as a benefit. And so really, as Libby mentioned in the beginning, we're looking for a community consensus in identifying what's needed. And I'm just emphasizing that such what's needed has to be done in the context of recognizing the implicit costs of any choices that are made. You also, at some level need, and I've changed the words here a little bit, the value and cost. And here I'm thinking, you're thinking about the point relevant scientific communities, because if you're studying a certain thing, you might go, well, gee, I could get perfectly well with a cheaper reference material. So I don't need it that good. So why would I want to pay more for it to be that good? <laughs> Potential sponsors. As I said, the National Science Foundation has been my sugar daddy for 35 years, or will be by the time this next grant is through. So clearly they too are very concerned about the ratio between the value to them and the programs they support and the cost to them. People actually producing reference materials are looking to make sure they're providing more value than they're spending money. And anybody buying one has to think about this. So in this discussion, I'd like to emphasize that these are the things that we have to think about. I haven't, as Libby suggested, a dream of the way forward. I don't have one. I have possibilities. Many of them could work, but I'm not gonna do it. So my real aim is to help those who ultimately are going to do it. So this last slide, I'd like to thank the many people and individuals and institutions who made sure we got here. Strikingly, of course, the National Science Foundation. The Department of Energy, though they did drop out earlier than had been expected, really had this attitude that to get this survey working well, we need these materials and we need these materials to go out internationally 
as well as to the US to get a global picture. And that showed in the ultimate quality of data across the world. The SCORE IOC group with that initial committee that started this going, my own institution, of course, and the NOAA Ocean Certification Program, who have essentially put the, the big work between us, behind us having this seminar today and uh, getting us to this point and looking to move it forward in the discussions. And then, of course, my deceased colleague, Dave Keeling, who died you know, over 15 years ago, but whose vision that CO2 was really important in the world and needed to be measured carefully is there. So that said, I'd just like to point out that in addition to the questions now, we're going to continue this discussion on this Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. And ultimately, uh, I will try to answer people there as practically as possible, and others can bring in things as well. So that's another opportunity beyond today. And I say this too, for those of you that are ultimately watching it for the first time on the YouTube channel that was mentioned earlier on, because I know it's a miserable time of day in Australia right now, and many of you will not be watching at this point. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Andrew. My name is Shalom Bush, I also work for NOAA. Um, so, Andrew, I just wanted to thank you for explaining how your lab got into producing and distributing CRMs, how you make CRMs, and what we might consider for the future of CRMs. Um, OA researchers and global citizens interested and concerned about ocean acidification are indebted to you and your contributions to science and service to the community. Uh, Andrew already mentioned that we will be sharing a recording um, of this, this uh, seminar today, and we're also going to move our questions onto the information exchange. Um, so let's get started with some of the questions that we already have, and I'll tee those up to you, Andrew. Um, so there's a few questions about the wait list. How do people go about getting on the wait list for reference materials? Is there a prioritization scheme? Um, and you know, does it matter what funding you're getting for that prioritization scheme? At this moment, you're on the wait list if you asked us for reference materials. Uh, my assistant, Laura Schiller, has been keeping track of all of those. And so you're there, but many of you, I'm sure, were hoping for lots of reference materials by comparison with what we're ever likely to have available in the short term for you. We are going to be starting a process of uh, referring back to people to point this out individually. And as for priorities, there is priority. I did mention the effort that is being made to prioritize US open ocean survey cruises that happened in 2021. The one that is happening at the moment, the NOAA has one planned for the West Coast region of the USA later this summer. And there will be, there is a dream of another more international global cruise in the Indian Ocean from the US at the end of this year. I don't know how likely that is to really happen. It's very hard to tell these things now. So those have the priority. But as I noted, they too will be short shift, short changed on the number of materials available to them. And in terms of other priorities, it's not based on where you're funded from. It's probably largely based on some sort of interaction with you and when you originally had sent us an order. So keep sending orders in. We will obviously do our best to do whatever we can. It is not going to be enough for some time yet. Great, thanks Andrew. Uh, one of our attendees asked, could you compare your CRM operations with the IATSO OSIL standard seawater production? And could this model be emulated? The Yes, I, I can compare them. The IAPSO production currently is done in the United Kingdom at a private company, Ocean Scientific, in the south of the England. It used to be done, like us now, in a university or in a, in a, a research laboratory setting. Before going to the private company, 
it was at the Institute for Ocean Sciences in the UK. Before that, it was in Denmark associated with their hydrography people. Over the years, a limited number of people have been in charge of it. It's actually very few people between it starting in the early 20th century to today, I think there are about five individuals have been involved in running it. Ocean Scientific as a company, I've spoken to their uh, people there. This is not their sole business. This is a sideline for them that they have historically adopted and do well. They collect the water uh, in association with the research lab from the North Atlantic. They bring it back to their laboratory. They have, like I showed you there, a kind of bottling party with lots of people gradually getting them into the bottles and clipping the uh, serum caps on and all the rest. And they have a careful and capable laboratory doing one analysis, the salinity, and ensuring the link back to potassium chloride solutions for how well that salinity is reliably done. So there are many analogies. And when you say, could it be done the same way? The answer is yes, it kind of already is, but it's not done in a private company. And the transition to a private company for them, I know, took trouble, time, and the interest from the right kind of individuals at the right time. So that's not, I think, a straightforward approach, but it's a possible one. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question about um, secondary solutions. Could we consider preparing quote unquote substandard solutions for alkalinity titrations using natural seawater that is filtered and poisoned with uh, mercuric chloride, calibrated using a minimal number of CRMs that you could provide? How long would the substandard be stable without UV radiation? I think the answer there is yes, but there is a but. First, as I pointed out to you, we have had, we mentioned, I mentioned uh, six batches that had problems with mercury tolerant organisms. We have seen also mercury tolerant organisms in my laboratory a number of times. The easiest way to acquire them is to have solutions in the laboratory that are seawater with mercury in, open to the atmosphere for some period of time. And so if you don't have that problem, it's relatively trivial. A filtered seawater that has been poisoned with mercury chloride, the UV part is, I would say at this point of largely unknown qual uh, effect on what it role it really plays for microorganisms. The problem being that seawater absorbs so much UV, it may not actually leave enough energy to hurt a microorganism, or at least to hurt every microorganism. And so we believe that samples of seawater poisoned like that last for years, if they, particularly if they were filtered, in Pyrex type bottles, that borosilicate 33, bottles. But if you happen to get a mercury tolerant organism in there, you're doomed. And you'll never see it until you know later that the measurements you got last month are not the same as the measurements you get this month. And that's the harder part in ensuring that. Calibrating against us, obviously, is a useful approach. And it increases the overall uncertainty of measurement. But that's probably not the major potential contribution. The real concern is having a way to know that what you made is remaining stable in the bottles over a period of time. And that's the part you would need to emphasize. Yes, it can be done. And uh, the degree to which these are substandard, using the English phrase for some below standard, is what you would discuss. But as what I would refer to as a secondary standard or an internal laboratory standard, no question that this is a way to go. Great, so I think you just answered this question, but I'm gonna ask it directly so people can hear it. 
Um, what should you do if you cannot get access to CRMs? There are a variety of things you can consider. What you really end up with is, we go back to my original comment, why, how are you using CRMs? Are you using them to calibrate the equipment or are you using them to see if the equipment is behaving properly? If it's the second one, then all you need is a stable seawater that you can go back to over and over and check. But if you're doing it for the calibration, then you have to worry just how the hell do I calibrate CO2 when I've kind of got out of the habit of even thinking about it because these CRMs were available to do it. Or certainly these reference materials were available to do it. And there are ways to do that. Alkalinity can be done fairly well with synthetic solutions, but it, it's problematic. There are, there are a variety of problems there. But, you know, realistically, if you, that you can do it fairly well. Total carbon, people have done it with sodium carbonate solutions. So either way, you can do it. But bear in mind, those early cruises that I showed that were all different from the cruises in the WOS period, all had skilled analytical chemists thinking about it, all looking to calibrate those total carbon measurements by some version of what you are forced to try and think about today without our access to us. And so it can be done, but it is clearly not as straightforward as you would hope. And I just offer you caution and certainly through the exchange, I will share advice with people for specific questions. So this is uh, related to that last comment. Do you have documents available describing steps that others could use to prepare secondary standards? I have a written description of our approach to preparing our reference materials. Were you to prepare secondary standard st stable seawaters, where the goal here is just that they be stable, that methodology would likely work for you. But I fear you might experience some of the problems we also experience. I know my student, Emily, who had done work with us extensively and seen the problems, commented that when she tried to do this herself, She'd had batches that worked and batches that clearly had, clearly had problems with mercury tolerant organisms in them. So, yes, I can offer some, but we don't, and we, I can offer other ways that I would say this is a good way to calibrate an acid for doing a alkalinity analysis. I have methods for that too. Calibrating total carbon separately not so easily because all our methods written were aimed at using manometry predominantly. There is that method with the sodium carbonate solutions, which was put together at the time of the WOS program when people were still a little doubtful about our reference materials. It did work then. It was tedious, but it does exist as a written document. So the answer is partly these exist. Great. Is there any uh, laboratory or company that has showed interest in starting to produce these uh, ocean carbonate chemistry references? I'm only aware of two thus far. I'll talk about the most recent first. The ICOS group have made what they hope is a stable seawater put in bottles similar to ours. And they are making this available within ICOS and have advertised it on a website and you can find things about that. Their calibration of it is against older batches of our reference material, I believe. Separately, in Japan, a huge effort went in to try to see if you could make 
well, first, a context. In Japan, they developed a technique for preparing seawater nutrient reference materials by taking a large volume of seawater and autoclaving it and then packaging it in a clean room. And they have tried to extend this to making seawater reference materials. But it has a problem that when you autoclave seawater, you actually get precipitations and you have to wait a long, long time for that to go away and then make sure you're mixed thoroughly and then put it into bottles and then do the analysis. And they've only done a limited amount of that. And I think it's still something that's in their minds, but it was in both cases, a very significant investment. And I don't think it's seen as the nutrients are seen as moving forward. The CO2, I've not heard of it moving forward for sure. As I said, I spoke to the people at the Ocean Scientific. And when I mentioned what I spent compared to what came in, they went, huh, we wouldn't touch that. Clearly, things have to be changed to make that a more viable concern to think of as a private company. And that's from their point of doing the seawater one. Um, of course, that's one, one time they weren't so prejudiced because they didn't know. <laughs> and so uh, who knows quite whether there are others. Those, those are really the only ones that I can think of because numbers have mentioned the possibility, but then they start to recognize that the startup cost, which we were very fortunate to get that initial grant from the US National Science Foundation for the pre-JGOS activity was somewhat substantial for them just to kind of find and see if this is what they wanted to do. All right, I'll give you a, a softball now. Is there any alternative to the Epizone Greece? Uh, th the phrase yes, but comes in mind. Clearly, the goal of the appears on Greece, it, it achieves two things, in my opinion. Number one, it makes certain that there is no exchange between stuff in the bottle and stuff outside of the bottle, because it's essentially an impermeable bar bar barrier to water, to CO2. Those are the ones that matter most, and to microorganisms. So you need a seal that achieves that impermeable barrier. And surely there are some out there. We've tried a variety with screw-on caps. And the answer is it sometimes works. But because those screw-on caps depend upon pressurizing uh, a polymer to a certain extent, ensuring every bottle is done the same way, is not practical without automated machinery. So we haven't gone down that road, except to find out that in actual fact, if you filled a bunch of bottles and kept weighing them, some of them lost weight due to evaporation, even though you thought the top was screwed on. And some didn't, because presumably the top was screwed on better. And so it's really, if you redesign the package, redesigning the seal is gonna be part of it. But the hard part is to make seals that people have found work well in other ways. The early uh, ones at the Ocean Scientific were ampoules. That is, they put the seawater into glass and used glass blowing techniques to pull down the tube at both ends to seal it completely. So that was the seal, just glass. It was in a glass container you had to break to get at. Now they put it in glass bottles with serum caps. But the glass bottles they use are actually not the borosilicate 33 glass. They're an alternate borosilicate glass with a higher coefficient of expansion and which we have found the alkalinity of seawater changes slowly in those bottles with time. And the problem is that there aren't any 
larger commercially available serum bottles made out of borosilicate 33. We had some custom made. And when you do that, in fact, crimping the seal, if you have some help with a machine to do that, can be very reliable. And so that works. But the problem there is that the glass availability of the bottles cheaper. It was going to be a lot more expensive to have bottles that were big enough for people to use with a crimped serum cap seal on it made of the glass we knew it needed to be. So we've not done it. So the answer to your question, I started with yes, but. And I'm afraid that those were the buts. Great. We have um, quite a number of questions about alternatives to mercuric chloride. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, but not as much as you'd like. The clear need is for something that can be used as an alternative. But you have to bear in mind that one of the reasons that mercury is used is because it works. It kills microorganisms. It is toxic. It is nasty stuff. So to a simple approximation, pretty well anything that works is going to be nasty stuff at some level. And we're looking for something that's not quite so nasty in terms of its ultimate implications for other life than microorganisms, especially human. And I have a project funded through the NOAA Libby, through Lower Libby in the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program to investigate that. And I have a master's student who's been working on that. It got slowed down, of course, as you might imagine from the COVID piece right now. And she's done a number of experiments that show that simplistically the results she's got so far show that if you really filter the water carefully, alkalinity tends to stay quite good without even poisoning it for a reasonably sh for a short period of time. We've, we're currently looking, our, our simplistic goal is something that keeps it stable for one month. Our reference materials are stable for three years. And just filtering pretty well does that for alkalinity if you're not too fussy about how much the alkalinity changes. We found that using silver can do this, but we're investigating it further. We found that using copper completely screws up the carbonate system. And you get results that make little sense compared to the parallel samples we took and put mercury in as a comparison. We've tried it with a variety of other things. We're looking at potential organic compounds that can do this. But the problem, again, is if you're going to do this in a way that works for alkalinity, anything you add can't really compromise the acid-base chemistry. And that restricts the range of chemicals. And so it's still a rather empirical area looking at different chemicals that plausibly do this, because there's many things that kill microorganisms. But they don't all do it absolutely reliably and at levels that don't change your solution and with ingredients that don't ultimately affect the acid-base chemistry of the solution. And so that's the hard search. So at the moment, filter gets you quite a long way at first. But uh, silver, we have some hope for, but some and hope are words that you wouldn't really like to have together, and I'm afraid you do. Thank you for that. And we can continue that conversation more on the information exchange to get at the nuances some of the people were asking about. Um, so in our last question, I was wondering if you could opine a little bit more about the future and um, the value of public-private partnerships, um, the role of academia, the role of government, um, any other thoughts there? Yeah, well, there's a, an expression attributed to a 20th century quantum physicist, which is prediction is especially diff it is difficult, especially about the future. Uh, the benefit of partnerships potentially with private enterprises 
is that it brings a new view onto how you think about balancing costs and benefits. And it's possibly a view that makes the costs more manageable or enhances the benefits in some way. Uh, a private enterprise can in many places behave in ways that would be in inappropriate in university laboratories or government run institutions, both in how they conveniently get things done with differing levels of bureaucracy and perhaps in corners they're prepared to cut. This may or may not be a good thing. So the, I, 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 I think it's got a lot going for it, but the downside is that private industries do well when they're prepared to give up things that aren't working. And we need this to work. I, I remember a friend of mine that went into private industry said the hardest thing having done a PhD was that you would come in and the project you had been working on for six months stopped as of last Friday. You're doing something different now. Do not touch that ever again. Go. It didn't attract the kind of person that some of this work tends to benefit from. Certainly none of the individuals in my lab would be comfortable with that concept, including myself. But I think that's a necessity of having an effective private business is that ability to draw a line and move on. And that's a risk when you have private because there is no flexibility for continual losses. Great, thank you for that and for this entire webinar, Andrew, and thank you to our many attendees for their excellent questions and their interest. Um, and like Libby said at the beginning, we consider this just the start of a conversation. As you can tell, it's, it's multifaceted going from business to technical carbon chemistry to billing and production and vessels all sorts of things. So uh, we really need to build a strong community-wide process for ensuring the future of CRMs. We encourage people worldwide to fill out the CRM community survey that we will circulate when the webinar is ready to post. Um, so thank you again to Andrew, to uh, Noah for hosting this, um, and to everyone for attending. And with that, I will close the webinar. Thank you, Shilin, for organizing this on our behalf. I know how much work you've put into getting this going. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye, everyone.